much to conversation. A pleasure to welcome to the program. A gentleman who's been a guest a number of times in the past is Lawrence Finer. He's PhD. He's a mathematician, PhD out of uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Yeah, we're a major school in that kind of thing. And he's also got an interest in uh, some political matters uh, of the economy and so forth. He's written a major book in that regard along with his partner. And he's uh, got a great interest in the geopolitics of the Middle East well, the Middle as East, well. Yeah. And uh, Lawrence, so good to see you again. Welcome to Manhattan Network. Okay, fine. Okay, first the Israeli election. You want to talk about the election? Okay, uh, we'll talk about the election. Why don't you spell, if you may, uh, spell it out for people who may not have realized that there was an election recently okay. and the implications of it. Uh, okay. okay. There was an election recently in Israel. Uh, the polls projected Netanyahu to be far ahead. Yeah. The polls said that he'd get up to nine seat majority. In fact, he got a two seat majority. Mm -hmm. uh, 61 seats for the rightist parties and 59 seats for the center and leftist parties. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, so, uh, and there were two surprises in this election. Okay, no. most surprising was the rise of two new parties to the political left and right of Netanyahu's Likud Betenu coalition. Uh -huh. Yer Lapid's Yesh I Atid, There Is a Future, garnered 196 in its first showing, second only to Likud Betenu. Mm -hmm. Lapid, who has referred to the, his party as center center, has now emerged as the kingmaker in Israeli politics if Netanyahu would like a broad coalition. Lapid was able to gain votes from the center from those who wished to moderate Netanyahu and he siphoned votes away from the right by avoiding any partnership with left-wing parties. Uh -huh. Part of Yesh Ati's appeal across the political spectrum is that it is a party of fresh talent who now turn to politics bringing with them real-world experience. The party remained independent and above the fray, concentrating on achieving universal conscription, a principle likely to be a thorn in the side of the religious right. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, now Lapid yeah, 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 yeah. La is an actor and a journalist okay. who turned to politics. Yeah, relatively young, right? Relatively young. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and a surprise and for a him surprise to get such a large to, to portion get such of a the large vote. Yeah, yeah. Election. Were you surprised personally? Yes, I was surprised. I Even you that. were. Who I expected it. the right to do suppressingly well. Uh -huh, yeah, right. Okay, yeah. Okay, the other surprise was the rise of Naftali Bennett's right wing party, Habayit Yehudi. Bennett has a unique experience as a businessman running the Settlers Council, working with Netanyahu in the Prime Minister's office, and as a former member of Israel's most elite commando unit. His party gained three seats in 2009, but guarded 12 in this election. While the number is, 80, 60 is somewhat lower than the 15 seats analysts recently projected, his rise is nothing short of meteoric. Bennett advocates annexing 60% of the West Bank and was one of the few candidates to openly criticize Netanyahu for not sending ground troops into Gaza last November to root out Hamas. Mm. The latter position resonated with much of the Israeli electorate who see the current ceasefire as at most a temporary fix and his poll numbers skyrocketed as a result. Now what does that tell us? Well, it tells that... Uh, what does it tell us about the state of things in Israel, in your perception? The state of things in Israel is that the Israelis are very distrustful of the Palestinians in Gaza. Yeah, oh yeah, well sure. Yeah, you know. yeah uh-huh. Okay, well this is Bennett's peace plan, which is kind of a non-starter, but here it is okay. to show you kind of how he's thinking. Uh -huh. On February 2012, Bennett published a plan for managing the Israeli-Palestinian conflict called Naftali Bennett Stability Initiative. The plan is based in parts on parts of early initiative, Peace on Earth by Adi Mintz and the Israeli initiative of Benny, Benny Elon. And, where are we here? And relies on the statements of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and his Likud party. And Likud party ministers that spoke in favor of unilateral annexation of the West Bank, which he calls Judea and Samaria. Mm -hmm. Bennett does not support Palestine's right to exist. I will do everything in my power to make sure that they never get a state. Mm -hmm. Bennett suggests a tripartition of the Palestinian territories. Israel should unilaterally annex Area C. Okay, that's the area where the Palestinians don't have authority. Okay. In Area A, yeah. they have complete authority. In Area B, they have joint authority. You're talking West Bank? Friends. West Bank. Yeah, yeah, right. Okay, yeah. Okay, now, yeah. A and B comprise 42% of the West Bank. Right, 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 right. Israel should unilaterally annex Area C, where they have authority over the Gaza Strip should be transferred to Egypt, while Areas A and B would remain 
with the Palestinian National Authority, however, under the security umbrella of the IDF and Shin Bet to ensure quiet, suppress Palestinian terrorism, and prevent Hamas from taking over the territory. Area C comprises 62% of the area of the West Bank. You have a map they're referring to in that article? Uh, or no, 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 no a mental map. Okay, mental map. okay, okay. And okay. approximately 365,000 Israeli settlers. The Palestinians that live in these areas will be offered Israeli citizenship or permanent residency status between 48,000, according to Bennett. Finally, Israel would invest in creating roads so Palestinians can travel between areas A and B without checkpoints and invest in infrastructure and joint industrial zones because peace grows from below through people and people in daily life. Mm -hmm. Bennett also resists immigration of Palestinian refugees now living outside of Judea and Samaria or the connection between the Hamas-controlled Gaza and Judea and Samaria. Uh -huh. Okay, so basically yeah, that's yeah. Bennett's plan. Uh -huh. And it's interesting to note that even uh, Lapid mm -hmm. advocates that Israel should retain control of the major settlement blocks mm -hmm, mm -hmm, with the bulk mm -hmm. of the settlers. Uh -huh. uh, 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 and what are the implications in terms of the attitude of, uh, well, Netanyahu uh, toward, uh, let's say, uh, Iran? And or well, Syria. I, hopefully, uh, hopefully, you know. the the fact that that Netanyahu wants any kind of a stable governing coalition will have to bring in centrists. Yes, that's hopefully right. Hopefully, that will moderate his policy towards Iran and Syria. I hope. And, and the election return came, as I understand it, and reading it uh, not as carefully as you and so forth, but as a general citizen, it came as a big surprise to a whole lot of people all around the world. It came just a big surprise. Yeah. Yeah, and it may, it's a game. Changer, do you think? I don't or know. No, not, no not you don't really. know. No. Okay, so or what is this the implications? What, do, what are the implications? What are the implications for Israeli Palestinian settlement? Yeah. You know, uh, agreement. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I think it's inconceivable to me that Israel's going to. There are 513,000 settlers, a half a million settlers in the West Bank. Yeah, I know. It's, it's just, inconceivable yeah. that no. Israel is going to, um, you know, with go back to 67. Yeah, go back to 67 <laughs> yeah, right, by yeah. removing the settlers or allow the settlers to live under Palestinian sovereignty in a Palestinian state. Uh -huh. And thus, it's um, kind of hard to imagine how a sovereign Palestinian state could arise. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. In fact, this reminds me of a somewhat amusing story. In uh, 1985, mm -hmm. uh, the PLO rep to Lebanon, Shafiq al Houth, yeah. um, gave a Q&A at the uh, uh, UN Church Center, 777 UN Plaza. What year? 1985. 85. 85. Yeah. Okay, back to 85. And yeah. he was asked whether there would be a viable Palestinian state. And he said, well, you know, that's a dream I share with my dog. And with the dog, yeah, yeah. right, like that. Well, okay. What and also he was asked, yeah. mm -hmm. he said, is, the is, that, is it true that the Palestinians only want a state? That's all he wanted, is that they, all they want is a state. He said, you know, actually they want a hotel and a restaurant. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. So he had a good sense of humor. Shall yeah, yeah, a good, a good sense of humor is it helps you out in this yeah, world. Yeah, you need it, you know, that kind of a thing. But what is it, what, what is your thought now? You've been, why don't you share with, you're a mathematician and you're MIT and you've also got an interest in economic theory and that kind of thing, which we want to get to. But uh, when did you pick up uh, personally on, with a, with a, with a very, Active uh, concern for the Middle East and well, particularly okay, this, Israel. Wh this when did was, you get into that? I really got into the, this when uh, I started the Cambridge Forecast Group. Okay, that's the uh, publishes this book. Yeah, and we predicted, and this was our worst prediction. That was a uh, real flop. Uh -huh. We predicted on our first noodle that there would have to be cooperation between OPEC and the developed countries okay. in order to stabilize the world economy. In other yeah. words, in order to sop up excess petrodollars right, right, to right. control inflation, to reconvert, to convert uh, third world long, short term debt, excuse me, okay. third world short term debt into yeah. third world long term debt, okay. which is far more payable. Yeah. To allow the uh, the third world to keep its import markets open. Might be a lesson there for the to help the trade deficits of the yeah. United States. Right. And, and there might be fact, a, yeah, there might be a lesson in that for the trade deficit. I mean, the, uh, the brinksmanship and everything that's going on in the Congress today. Yeah. For the United States. Anyway, but, Israel yeah, put the ahead. kibosh on this <coughs> basically by invading Lebanon. Uh huh. In because the Saudi Arabians insisted yeah. that if they were going to go along with this plan that Israel and the United States would have to deal with the PLO. Uh -huh. And Israel invaded Lebanon to destroy the PLO. Uh -huh. So that's 
you know, put the cabal. That's when down. they went. Is that when they went to Tunis then? That's when they went to. Uh, no, 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 Tunis no. was in '85 after the Achille Loro incident. Uh huh. Okay. And yeah. then this. Uh, that was no, another. Went, oh, excuse me. Yeah. No, in, uh, they went to Tunis. Uh, or Tunisia. Right after they were kicked out Tunisia. of Beirut. Tunisia. Yeah. Right. Right. Right, right after they kicked out of uh, Beirut. Right. And then, uh, and then in '85, there's the Achille Loro incident, which I believe was staged by Saddam Hussein. You do yeah, really? I believe really? that was. Yeah. Because. Uh, uh, Abu Abbas, yeah, Abu Abbas, who was, who was the, the key figure in that, the Achille Lawrence, and he was the uh, head of the PLO in Baghdad. Yeah, yeah, I, uh, I, I, su I suspect that Saddam Hussein engineered that in order to prevent the meeting between the PLO and Margaret Thatcher. Is this is this is this, uh, is this generally understood? In uh, that I don't know. That no, no, really you know. you think that way? That's what yeah. I think. Yeah, because yeah. he didn't want because you know as long as the PLO. Uh, as long as the Palestinians could not negotiate with the West, yeah. Saddam Hussein had diplomatic clout because he was the guy they had to rely on, the West had to rely on. Was there anything in particular in your own personal life that made you become interested in a, in a way with the Middle East, is what I was asking you. Was it a change for you? Had you been interested when you well, were a teenager? No, well, I, was, I was a teenager, or, no. Not, no, not, no you I weren't. was kind of distant from the Middle East when I was a teenager. Yeah, right. I remember in 56, uh-huh, uh, -huh. uh I remember the 56 Suez crisis. Oh boy, I well, remember that well, too. Well, I thought yeah. Nasser was a hero for uh, defying the British and the French. I went through there in 1957. Oh, oh, really? I hitchhiked through as a young man, crazy, with no money and everything. I was just hitchhiking through, the, having been in Europe, you know, and then going through the Middle East. And I got to, uh, went all through there and had a hell of a time getting into Israel because I didn't know you couldn't go on with a passport and everything. And then I ended up on a boat from Beirut. I had to go to Cyprus and I had to go to, uh, to Beirut. And I went on a boat okay. down to Port Said. And I was so innocent abroad with a camera. And there were bomb holes because oh, okay. uh, they had bombed. The French and British had uh, bombed and they were at Port yeah. Said. And I walked up to a fellow and uh, said, uh, I'd seen the map that goes along the, Israel, the, Pan the, the canal. And I said, uh, could you tell me how, where's the road that goes to Cairo by Ismailia along? And I said, it goes along the Suez Canal, you know? And yeah. he looked me over and he put, they, they, they arrested me. They put me in jail, oh, you okay. know? But that thing in Eisenhower, I think, took a very, very, uh, a very, very enlightened stance yeah, he told in terms he, of that. He, he, told he really he, did. He told that was the defining moment. He was going to start a run on the pound. Uh, yeah, uh, right. Among other things. he told Israel, by the way, he told Israel, that he would abolish the tax exempt status of Jewish charities if Israel didn't withdraw from the Sinai. Well, that was the, some of the pressure he could put upon them, yeah. but I think that the pressure that he exerted in that yeah, part of the world was, a, was an enlightened one. My what mother was hysterical. I remember my mother was hysterical. She was? Was she? Uh, uh, why? Well, tell well, me. Well, because, you know, it's generational, because, yeah. because, the because of uh, Eisenhower threatening to put the to abolish the tax exempt status of Jewish charities. So, so she was, uh, was she uh, uh, died in the wool Zionist? Yes, yes, I think she was. She a lot was, of people, a lot of people were yeah. then. I, I, I liked Nasser then. I thought that he, you know, he was a hero. Yeah, from the anti well, he was trying pan Arabism. But you know, my dad not have been a bad he idea. He made a pun. He said Nasser. Hitler didn't disappear. He jumped in the Vasa and came out Nasser. Came Nasser <laughs> means wetter. You know? oh, that, that, he jumped in the Vasa. That's and a came nice out poetic Nasser. literation and everything like that. I'm not so sure. And also, Maybe. my Egyptian friend Serene, uh -huh. her family was kicked out of uh, Egypt then. What, what? Her father was a an executive at Philips Electronics, and they okay, lived in yeah, Egypt. Right. And she was adopted. I think they, they were they were kicked out of Egypt. So, but you were saying in your earlier life you had a passing kind of interest in it. Well, but then you picked out you picked out you're really serious at Finkelstein and all the you're really seriously interested in that area and concerned about it. With mainly from, from, the, from the Cambridge Forecast Group. From the Cambridge Forecast. Yeah, the fact Forecast. that Israel foiled all of our predictions, we said, you know, there's something that we haven't really taken into account. Well, what, what is the metaphor we can use for the state of Israel? Are they uh, not uh, a technologically advanced superpower in terms of their ability to Yeah, they're to a technologically develop? advanced superpower. And what happens in hi history, isn't it usually that a technologically advanced superpower can go and rule over other people yeah, that they are in advance of in oh, terms right, of right, evolution? Right, exactly. And it's called realpolitik. Realpolitik. Yeah. Is that emerging now? Well, you know, if you, look at, if you look at Israel, Palestine, yeah. that's the world writ large. It's a developed area interleaved with an underdeveloped area. Right. And some, yeah. and that's directly, the world. directly, a, a developed yeah. area. You know, the develop, developing countries are developing now, but they still have barriers of backwardness. Yeah. So it's a developed area interleaved with a, 
And uh, so anyway, my mother was hysterical, I remember, during the Suez Crisis. Yeah. And then uh, I remember in 67, I was thinking, wait a minute, <laughs> if Egypt and Syria lost all their planes on the ground, yeah, yeah, then yeah. they didn't invade Israel. Yeah, yeah, Israel yeah. started up this yeah. war. I think, uh, do you think that it was right from 48 that Israel had the upper hand military? Oh, absolutely. It seems that, because absolutely. they were trying to say we were, you know, like... Uh, uh, the book, what's the, what's the movie about, uh, you know, uh, the, Paul Newman starred in that Yeah, movie? Exodus. Exodus. Exodus and that, that they were, the, they were disadvantaged. No, no, all. no. They, they, but that's not the case. They had know, the, the geopolitical advantage from the beginning. In the 47-48 war, Israel had more men in the field than the Arab armies did. Uh, as many or more men. Okay. Because they could mobilize the entire male population. Yeah. And the Arab countries were poor. They couldn't afford to mount large armies. Well, they were getting some pretty good petrodollars in some of those, uh, those Arab countries. Well, this know. was the Saudis weren't really involved in the. You know, the that they was Egypt. That was Israel. That was Egypt, of Jordan and Saudi yeah. and and Syria that were involved. I've got friends. And Iraq sent the battalion. Yeah, I've got Iraq friends in Indonesia and, and so forth in Pakistan and that and they resonate to the into the as Islamic. As Islamic. That's again yeah. another couple billion people or something, uh, to the Palestinian plight. Well, I also, mean it's it's a it's a it's a um, a centrifugal. Is a centrifugal, a centripetal force of unity, perhaps, yeah. among the two point, the two billion odd people of the Islamic faith. You don't think there's some degree of unity yeah, that some could be of arrived unity, yeah. because of that Palestinian yeah, example, also, by along the way, with uh, yeah. Kashmir and in India, maybe. Now, obviously, the settlements, the Israeli settlements, are a barrier to peace, but there are two other barriers. One of them is Israel will never agree to a divided Jerusalem. Uh, okay, well, never yeah. is a long time. Never but okay, is a long I understand what you're saying. Yeah, and, and Unless forced. Perhaps. And the second thing. And, and what might be something that could force them to take a well, really radical if, if, step? If, in the unlikely event that the, the UN applies sanctions to Israel. Okay, okay. I mean, if the UN, I mean, as it did to South Africa, as it does to Iran, as a rogue state. Okay. You know, uh, if. if, if um, that would have to be something out of the General Assembly. Out of the General they would Assembly. Never come out of the, the Security, Security Council. Council. And uh, yeah. or if the far left parties get an overwhelming majority yeah. in the Knesset, yeah, yeah, which is but this Israel will never agree to a divided divided Jerusalem. Even Paris wouldn't agree to a divided Jerusalem at the Tava talks yeah. back in two thousand and one. No, back in two thousand. Anyway, in two thousand was it two thousand? Mm. Anyway, so uh, and the second is the right of return. Right. Now, There's this is yeah. at the Camp David talks in yeah. 2000 and at the Taba talks yeah. in 2001, I believe, although mm. I'm not sure. I mean, uh, the, the, the hang up really was the right of return. Okay. Yeah. Now, Arafat yeah. wanted to postpone that for later uh -huh. because he knew that the Palestinians could never give. The right of return, which is Security Council Resolution 194, is okay. an individual right. It can't be signed away by Arafat or mm -hmm. anybody else. Mm -hmm. The refugees have the right of return. Now, In, Israel, that's a general principle. That's a general principle. Israel, Israel, Declaration Israel agreed rights. to this. It ought to get its UN membership. It agreed to take back the refugees. Uh -huh. Now, Arafat wanted to postpone Did this. Did that go right back to 48? Yeah. And he wanted to yes, bring it goes back. Back to 48. That's right. when the Universal Declaration Actually, of Human Rights. Actually, back to 47. 47. Now, okay, yeah. when the partition was declared, uh -huh. fighting broke out between the Jews and Arabs in yeah. Palestine. Right, right. In British mandatory Palestine. Uh -huh. Now, um, Israel, th now the, the, the Jews, or I guess Israel, the Jews, uh -huh. the, the, um, the Zionists, the, Haga the Haganah, Haganah, yeah. the Haganah yeah. they yeah, the came gang. up with something called Plan Dalit. Okay. Now the Arabs were Dalit? very weak. Is that a place? Or Dalit what? means Plan D. Dalit okay. is D. Oh, oh, sorry. Okay, yeah. Dalit right. means Plan D. Right. So they came up with Plan Dalit, uh -huh. and that was that they would attack the population centers and, and scare away the Palestinians. Uh -huh. So really? they, 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 and their one gamble was that the, whether they weren't sure whether the British would intervene because the British were still there. Yeah. So the, they yeah. attacked the population centers. The British would intervene. The British didn't intervene, excuse me, uh -huh. and something like 700,000 and 800,000 refugees flowed out of Palestine. Okay, yeah, right, right, and, right, uh, right, right, right. Now, in some cases, they were forced out. Rabin forced out the Arabs. Uh -huh. In other cases, they weren't forced out. For example, there are Ara Arabs in, in um, Nazareth. 
That's because right. the commander in charge of Nabrath allowed them to stay. Okay. In some cases, they were yeah. frightened away by the massacres, by the yeah. Deir Yassin massacre. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Yassin, other massacres. Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, so there was planned out. So basically, Israel kind of won the war before it started. Right. And uh, the they, war was never about, about Israel's existence. It was about, see, Palestine was divided into two areas. Right, right. The Jewish right. area and the right, Arab area. Right, right. The Palestine was how much of the Arab area goes to who? Yeah. How much goes to Syria? Yeah. How much goes to Egypt? Oh, I see. How much yeah, goes right. to Jordan? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and that was what the war was. It wasn't about Israel's existence. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There's a lot of mythology about Israel. Yeah, sure. You know, and then There's I a lot of mythology creep into geopolitics. In, in geopolitics, yeah, yeah. yeah. And the hardest battle that Israel fought was the Jordanians over Jerusalem, the okay. Arab Legion. The um, Arab Legion was the strongest, the most professional Arab force, and they gave the Israelis a hard time uh -huh. in Jerusalem. Okay. And what the Israelis do, they would get these yeshiva buckets right, right off the Hassan. boat, send them up against the Arab Legion. They generated a lot of casualties, uh -huh. and when the casualty figures began coming out, American Jews supported Israel overwhelmingly. But back again to this thing about technological uh, a a adherences, uh, if you talk to political scientists, political scientists, you're, you're a mathematician, but if yeah. you're, you're interested in politics and everything, or you're interested in, uh, in political science or understanding the political process, one of the things that political scientists will be very prideful of in their ability to deal with what is called reality rather than ideology yeah. or some sort of uh, doctored up th ethics or something like that, and that whoever's got the advanced position is able to impose, impose, their, will on impose the their will on the others. There's talk that uh, uh, the Medicis in Florence really liked uh, Leonardo primarily not because of his paintings, because he made a siege machine. A siege machine. That right. gave them advantage right, right. over the tribe in the other village. And so then you could, and that's the history of the world in a sense. Yeah, exactly. If you have an advanced technology, the British could uh, conquer India because they had the Gatling gun, which was in advance of the musket, that kind of thing. Yeah. So Israel is an advanced country and is in league with the advanced countries of the world and the history of the world, and that's called realpolitik. Realpolitik. Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So what are the realities there of, uh, they seem to be able to do Israeli uh, citizens or they're in West Bank or whatever, they seem to be able to do whatever they want because they have the overwhelming have the military advantage, they're, they're much like the Europeans did over the Plains Indians of yeah. North America. Yeah. There was they're no question about who was going to win. Yeah, I got the, you understand the, what I'm saying? They're the regional technological superpowers. Right, sure. right, right, right. And But the idea is that this is in the way in which it's, it's called realpolitik. Realpolitik. Yeah. And they, well, Karl Haushofer was a little bit different in that because real, re, real politics can be used sort of more genteely, yeah. saying it's just be realistic, you know, being realistic. But real politique is just right out, uh, it comes out of the end of a gun. Mao yeah. said power comes out of the end of the gun. And the real politique uh, notion <laughs> is that uh, whoever's got the military advantage is the leader. Okay, maybe so where does Israel, Palestine, the Arab world, the Islamic world, vis-a-vis uh, vis the developed Western world with its ally in India, uh, China, India, that sort of thing. How is it all shaking out in your estimation? Well, with Israel being having the upper hand. Uh, Israel having the upper hand over the Palestinians. Over the Palestinians. Okay, and is that in inevitable? That's the I case? They can do whatever they want. Given their technology. They will be able they to do... They can't expel the Palestinians. That's they one thing they can't. They can like to. But they can't. They oh, can't. by the way. Uh, yeah, go ahead. By the way. Uh, I put it in a historical In 2000 and 2001, uh, the Ta New York Times had a web forum where you could go and argue about things. Okay. And yeah. uh, just as an experiment, I, you know, I was the only pro pal Well, actually, I got Lenny Brenner and Norman Finkelstein to come on the forum. Well, with you're me. traveling in good company with uh, Lenny and, yeah. uh, and Finkelstein. But aside from that, we were the only. You got a lot of enemies among a lot yeah. of the Zionists among yeah. the people. We were yeah. the only. We were the only pro pro Palestinians on the forum, <laughs> and we were arguing about the West Bank and the settlers and so on. And just as an experiment, I said, "Look, why doesn't the United States just give the Palestinians citizenship here?" That will clear do, up, do what? Give the Palestinian citizenship here. 
Oh, okay. That will clear out the West Bank and Gaza. Israel will own it. The Palestinians will be happy uh -huh. because what the hell? They don't want to live in it. They'd rather live in it. They'd rather live, they'd rather in, rather live in the United States than, yeah, than the yeah, West Bank. Yeah, yeah. And every, the, the reaction was universally negative. Negative. Because a lot of the now, what, were, what, what was the what, what was the venue? Where were you? Where the New York Times web forums. Web for it was on the web. On the web, you could uh, go, you'd log into the New York Times okay, with your yeah. password and sign on okay. ID. Yeah. And then you post these. Each post was a little HTML, uh -huh. a little hypertext markup. Yeah, language. right. Uh -huh. And you go HTML bracket bracket. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And yeah. you uh, put your little thing in there, and you could have quotes and. You could have references. And what year is this thing you're doing? 2000, 2001. 2001. Okay, yeah. yeah okay, right, right. Uh, and, and you were the only ones who were pro-Palestinian. And I suggested that, uh, you know, that they that they would simply allow the Palestinians to come here and the refugees to come here. Well, that was a that was an interesting thing to do and everything. And the United States response is universal negative because a lot of the pro-Israel sentiment was just wog bashing. If they, you know, they would choose. Well, the that's president. what they used to call them wogs. Wog, and they the did the British and the imperialists. They don't want the third world people coming here. That's right. All. Well, okay, right. Or going that's to Israel, you know, that's or, part or, of it. or settling up with Israel. Uh -huh. Okay, and another thing. Uh, I remember after the, after the Israeli invasion of Lebanon in 82, my partner Richard said that s s apartheid in South Africa and Rhodesia will fall. Will, will fall. No, oh. commu uh, apartheid in Rhodesia and South Africa will end. Uh -huh. The Cold War will end and communism will fall before Israel settles up with the Palestinians. Okay. And that was really an accurate prediction. Yeah, yeah. And they haven't. And they've got the power. And they've got the power. Now, yeah. the election that did uh, did bring up uh, Mr. Netanyahu has been taking a lot of uh, angry words and uh, and veiling uh, Barack in order to get it on the, on the, on the same page and so forth vis-a-vis -vis Iran. Yeah. An, an Islamic Shia country. Yeah, the Islamic Shia. And then Syria is there now also going. But uh, so where does that all, the, the fact that he was um, by su surprising the world that this other fellow won and everything, it did bring some constraint to yeah, his, hopefully, his hopefully. rhetoric. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully. It brings, hopefully, it, hopefully the election results will bring some constraint on Israel as regards <laughs> Iran and Because Syria. he's definitely been uh, moving in that very unilateral kind unilateral. of powerful position of the overriding uh, ability, the conquering yeah. attitude of uh, very similar in certain ways of seeing of imperialism in general toward yeah. the uh, developing world and that sort of thing, don't you think? Yeah, yeah. I yeah, agree. you think I, that, I, I yeah? Agree. And it does represent. Why is it that so many people in America would be so in support on, and why in, nationally and, uh, and everything that the country as it's represented and everything could be so overwhelmingly in support of the country of Israel with so few people taking the stand that you, yeah. Lenny, and Finkelstein I think it's just ignorance. Others. At this point, it's just ignorance. ignorance. You think it's just ignorance? It's just ignorance at this point. Don't people want to tend to be with the winner? Yeah, I think people, right, people and if they like say the, somebody's I the think winner. we went over this before. Israel's a first world rich country. Yeah. Uh, Israel's in the rich man's club. Yeah. The Palestinians are not in the rich man's club. Right. The rich people like to hang together. Yeah. Rich people like, but you got a lot of people from the intellectual class and yeah. so forth. Is the support for Israel uh, just universal among the Jewish community? Is well, there uh, much as Norman Finkelstein said, opposition said, or uh, where, where, where does it all stand? As, the, as, as, as Norman Finkelstein says in his latest book, yeah. the Jews are beginning to re revise their opinion of Israel because that traditionally liberal and progressive. Yeah, and it was kind of a contradiction supporting a, a, a racist country was like there, Israel. Was there, like in the time of McCarthy and all that, was there support for Israel right through that, even in the progressive community because well, of the uh, Holocaust and, and everything um, else? That in is, 48, it's heavy duty psychology there. In, in the 48, part of a support lot of for the Israel was universal in the United yeah, States. It was universal among the Jews? Uh, un among everybody. Even the communists supported Israel then. Uh, really? Okay. In 48, even the communists. There had to be some pretty heavy, uh, there, if I understand, I did a program with uh, Yasser uh, yeah, in yeah, Tunis, yeah, so. you know. But there had to be some heavy duty, uh, what do you call it, lobbying of Mr. Truman. Yeah, by the there was Jewish a heavy lobbying, lobbying of, of, of Mr. Tr of Truman by... Uh, you understand, back in, yeah. you know, before the... Back in before 48, 48 yeah. So, I mean, I, was the nation, the United States, uh, ir irrevocably improve, uh, approved of Israel versus the Palestinians? Oh, absolutely. And absolutely. you say the progressives even. The progressives too. 
the Okay, how do we account for that? Because the Arabs were considered backward and mo and Muslim and reactionary. But that would be like uh, the progressive. Well, of course, that was when the we Arabs were under, under reactionary leadership. We just got you know. a new Pope Francis. I think yeah. it may be beneficial for the yeah Argentinian, very man of the common uh, of the people, as I understand from the commentary. Uh, as I understand, he lives in a house instead of a big castle or something. And he takes streetcar to work when he was a cardinal. And he was in favor of the less advantaged people yeah, less of the world. Okay, oh, the Palestinians are the less advantaged the people, less of, the people of the world. So is there not among all of the wisdom schools and from the political left or from the progressive, they're generally trying, and he's trying to be, he took the name Francis, St. Francis yeah. of Fisi. He's trying to be... So, uh, concerned with the least advantage yes. rather than cozying up to the powerful. Yeah, Aren't I'm, there a lot of people in the progressive yeah, community so. generally yeah, want yeah, to benefit yeah. or want to get in the side of the oppressed, like the Occupy movement yeah. here in the United States and so forth? And so why was there undying support for the powerful one, Israel, in there among the progressives, when usually the progressives would be standing up for the least advantage, that well, would be uh, the Palestinians. Sure, you know, sure. Well, Clear that up for I me. I have an answer to that. You okay, know, good. The Ma Americans have a misconception about the Israeli right. They think uh -huh. of the Israeli right as tough but pragmatic, which is not true. Realistic, Israeli, real politique. Yeah, real politique, but yeah. the Israeli right is very ideological. Is it really? Okay. For example, in the summer of 1980, my partner Richard and I mm -hmm. went to visit the head of the Israeli scientific consulate in Boston, Yitzhak okay. Gurlavi. Okay. And we want to explain to him why there was pressure now on Israel to settle with the Palestinians. Uh -huh. We said, look. Pressure from where? From the fact that Western OPEC cooperation is now required oh, oh, to oh. solve the third world debt crisis and the oil crisis. Okay. okay and the inflation right, crisis. Right. What year now is that? This is 1980, the summer of 1980. 1980. This the summer comes back to the time the of the you were uh, 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 with in your book. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we said that this is putting tremendous pressure on the United States to deal with the PLO. It's, put, it's um, putting tremendous pressure on Israel to deal with the PLO. Mm -hmm. And Israel's just to drag its heels now. I can uh -huh. find that the world moves in front of, moves past it. Mm -hmm. And so, and oh, that it finds that it completely mucks up the world economy. Mm. And by the way, that's why there's Japanese anti-Semitism. You know, in the 1980s. I didn't know there was. There was a whole spate of Japanese anti-Semitism. When? When? Again, 1980s. In the 80s. Now, yeah. they blamed Israel for causing Japan's depression. In the 1990s, because they blamed the oil? Israel. Well, because they blamed the Jews, excuse me, uh. the Jews for causing Japan's economic problems. Well, in a sense, it was Israel, because Israel blocked Western OPEC cooperation. Uh -huh. This meant that Japan had to export to the U.S., built up an enormous trade surplus with the U.S., uh -huh. with all the protectionist tensions that that uh -huh. involved. Uh -huh. So, uh, anyway, we went to visit. We said there's a tremendous pressure. Aren't, 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 uh, is it the Chinese or the, or the Japanese that are often thought of the Jews of the East? The Jews of the East. Which? Yeah. Is it both China uh, and I Japan? I think it's Chinese. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Anyway, so uh, what was I going to say? And the say? Jews, that means that they're they're bright and, and they're successful bright and, intellectual. And, and intellectual. Yeah, okay. Now, that, that, that's a that's a handle that could be well accepted by the Jewish population. But the Palestinians, by the way, are the I think Jews the Ju I think the the Jewish population, culturally or for whatever reason, have a great respect for the intellectual process. Yeah. Don't the, you? The Palestinians are the Jews of the Arab world. The Palestinians yeah. are the of the Arab world. Yeah, and my aide Zoila tells me that they're uh, the merchant class in Central America. The okay. Palestinians. They're the Palestinian. merchant class. Okay. In fact, Funes. The head of, of, of El Salvador is of Palestinian ancestry. Is he really? Well, yeah. There was, yeah, okay, go ahead. Who yeah. says what my aide Zoila tells me. Yeah. Uh -huh. Anyway, so, uh, what was I going to say? Anyway, we, we told them this, that there's pressure on the United States to, to deal with the PLO, uh -huh. and Israel shouldn't resist this pressure. Uh -huh. and, and he said to me, well, okay, I heard what you had to say. Let me tell you the way I see it. Mm -hmm. And I thought he was going to say something like, you don't know, the Saudis don't want a Palestinian state. They uh -huh. claim they do, but they really don't. Uh -huh. What he said was, God gave us the land. Uh -huh. yeah. So we yeah. don't care if we go down fighting or whatever, God gave us that land. God met uns. God it met seems uns. to be everybody thinks God yeah. is on their side. Don't and they Richard was it? terminally yeah. depressed. Yeah. He said, that, you know, and he talked that we had a staff member at that point, Mohammed Alwan, mm. who was an Iraqi Shiite. Mm -hmm. Uh, and a communist, uh -huh. and you know, uh, Richard mm -hmm. said, "Do the Israelis realize they have a crazy man on the diplomatic service?" <laughs> and Mohammed Alwad said, "That's the way they are. Yeah. You didn't realize that. Uh -huh. You know, they're crazy." Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
And anyway, this guy, Yitzhak Golov, he said he was depressed because his daughter was becoming a racist, and he never intended that to happen. Uh -huh. He just thinks the Arabs don't have the right to the land. He didn't think the Arabs were racially inferior. Uh -huh. But then it sort of it's, it very easily slides. It's not. It's, it's slides not, off into racism. Yeah, you had all that Nazi nonsense and all that kind of stuff that had just come out of that. It was such a horror. It was. It was a. It must have been horrible in the '40s to have to see that going on in Europe. It was going on from the Jewish perspective. Yeah. I mean that's deeply seared in a lot of people's thinking. You know. Also in the summer of '68, uh, my cousin arranged a meeting between me and a cousin of his friend. Mm -hmm. uh, the guy's name was Yossi, I don't know what his last name was. Yeah. He was an Israeli fighter pilot. Right. And I said, um, the, uh, at that point the Palestinians were coming out for a binational democratic state. Okay, yeah. And I said, the Israelis don't want it because it's not safe, right? it wouldn't be safe for the Jews. Oh. And he said, no, it would be safe. Yeah. I said, well, what, <laughs> what's the fighting about? Mm -hmm. Why don't they just agree to it? That's uh -huh. the peace. Yeah. He says, because it wouldn't be a Jewish state. I mm -hmm. said, so what? Do you still think that that's the most dangerous flashpoint in the yeah, world? Yeah, yeah, I, I do. I do. The, I the, the Israeli, the Israeli, the Israeli and what they might do thing. with Iran. Do you think that there's going to be any kind of a um, the uh, Huntington, you know, clash of civilizations? Of civilizations. Yeah, I hope and not. that there's going to be a clash between the uh, Islamic and the Western world. Yeah. Oh, by the way. Uh, and where does Israel and Palestine and that issue? relate in terms of informing or inspiring or whatever you could use not only the arab world not only uh, but the the muslim the muslim world yeah. in an anti-western uh, uh western european colonial attitude uh, manifest by what the marxists would call an imperialistic attitude on the part of the united states of america well uh you ever see that movie reds Oh, yeah, with, uh, yeah. yeah. There's one point where Zinoviev says that the future is not going to be a fight between the capitalists and the proletariat. It's going to be a fight between the, the West and the Muslim world. Okay, well, then that's the question I'm asking you now. And where does it fit in? If that's the flashpoint, that could be the thing. That's why it's satisfying to a lot of people that Mr. Netanyahu had, had to maybe uh, rein in a little bit his idea about let's reining some terror down on the country of Iran. Yeah, yeah, I know. That's a flashpoint. That's a flashpoint. It's very worrying. In a it's very year, worrying. In a, world, in a world of uh, uh, atomic weapons. Uh, yeah. nu super nuclear. What do you call them? Thermo thermal nuclear weapons. Yeah, thermal nuclear. Well, yeah. Hopefully, I hope that the yeah. current situation in the Israeli Knesset will put some restraint on Netanyahu as far as he Are you hopeful of that? I don't know. Are you wishfully thinking? I'm wishfully you, thinking, I guess. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'm wishfully thinking. How do you account for the election return that came as a surprise to uh, all? Actually, what I was reading, yeah. it wasn't really the West Bank or anything like that. Yeah. It was social issues like conscription, uh -huh. taxes, you know, health benefits, I don't know, whatever, you know. Yeah. Social issues rather Mondane. than Mundane. Like uh, all lo all politics. There's a lot of resentment of the of the of the uh, of the religious because they avoid government conscription and they avoid government service. So there's yeah. a lot of res what do right. you call them again? I forget what they call them. A lot of resentment against them. Well, you know the Natura Carta or the uh, you know or the uh, Orthodox. Yeah, yeah. Oh, the Natura Carta yeah. used to have a deficit every. You know, on that salute to Israel parade, yeah, they'd burn the Israeli flag. I know, I know, I know. And uh, Carol would get them the Israeli flag because they I couldn't they couldn't buy an Israeli flag <laughs> because it was treif. Right, it was unclean. Yeah, right. So Carol would get them the Israeli flag. Yeah, and I then know. they'd burn the Israeli flag. Yeah, and there was always like two rows of policemen yeah. between. But now they're arguing. They're arguing. I've, I've done a lot of programming with the Natura, You know, Weiss and 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 Rabbi Dome. He's a major spiritual yeah, leader yeah. in London. Right. Did a program way back with him, and what their object in is uh, to they saying it's a heresy because uh, in the Judaic tradition uh, you are not to be in advance or until the Messiah has come. The Messiah, yes, the so Moshiach. The Moshiach, yeah. and there, where is the Moshiach? Yeah, is uh, Netanyahu Moshiach? No, 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 no or no. what? But it's it's blasphemy on the orthodox tradition that's held for a long time among the Jewish uh, population. E e do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. And what about that argument? Um, well, I remember that, you know, uh, those demonstrations. Because the, the core issue to the Jewish presence and personality is the idea of the Mashiach. The Mashiach, yeah. And it's, a, it's, a, it's in keeping with the prophetic tradition of the future 
rather than just just reifying the immediate uh, context which so many mistakes have been made. Uh, yeah, when Natura Carta was giving those demonstrations, doing those demonstrations, yeah. people from the parade would come and say, the Mashiach has returned, the yeah. Mashiach has returned, well, that'd you be, can go that, back. That, that would be the, uh, what do they call that? Uh, what's that one out in Brooklyn? Uh, the, um, the, the one they come up, uh, the one with Shearson. Um, Oh, Rabbi Shneerson Lubavitch. Yeah. Lubavitch. They thought he Lubavitch. Was, Lubavitch. might be the Mashiach. They come up to with the Mitzvah Mobile, the Mitzvah. and they say, the Mashiach, we want Mashiach yeah. now. Now, that's a yearning that's been there, and then to hold to that <laughs> prophetic tradition. Constantine got rid of the prophetic tradition by making a, 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 a pact with power. A pact with power. A pact with the leader, a pact with the Romans. You know, that kind of thing. But you make a, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. But to have a tradition that goes back, that is the prophetic okay. tradition, and where the heck, if this is the time of some sort of real liberation, where is Moshiach? Yeah, where is Moshiach? Now, what is that, what did the Jewish people, Reform and otherwise, say to that idea that the Orthodox people, the Jewish people... Well, the Reform people kind and of And is it a real it. pain in the neck to the uh, political leadership of Israel this uh, this Natura Karta attitude. Yeah, yeah, they are. We should be waiting for the, the Mashiach, Mashiach, and that's just all nonsense. Or is it given any credence, or what? I don't know. I'm not a good question. You're not. You're uh, not. You're I'm not that familiar with it. Okay. Anyway, I want to go. Okay, go ahead. This. Now you're this talking to me. You now wait a minute. Just take a second. You've got the book. Let me let me hold it up. Can you okay. keep your? I keep the place. Keep the I book. know. Here it is. See if you can't come in on this. This is the book that he and his partner have written, and maybe you can give the title, okay? The Reagan Revolution okay. and the Developing Countries. The Reagan Revolution and the Developing Countries. This is a book you put out in what year now? It put it out in 2011. 2011, and it's written by your, you and your partner. It's written by me and my partner. I've kept a, my finger in the place where you wanted to read from, so go ahead. You okay, want this to read is the chapter it. I'm proud of. It's mm -hmm. the world economy from Charlemagne to Reagan. You're, you're particularly proud. I'm particularly you're proud of it. Aren't you proud of the whole book? I'm proud of the whole book. Okay, thank but you. But this Lord. is basically yeah. a popularization of Samir Amin oh, Samir and Amin. Perry Anderson uh, and Eric Jones. Okay. okay it's three, okay. three so, um, from 1000 AD to 1700 AD, while Europe was making the transition from feudalism to early capitalism, yeah. the rest of the civilized world on the Eurasian continent was being <coughs> periodically battered by Mongol, Turkic, and Tungusic nomadic invasions. True. These invasions half depopulated Russia, decimated China, and practically annihilated Persia and large parts of the Middle East. They ultimately led to the pre-colonial government of much of what is now known as the Third World, the Ottoman Empire, Mughal India, and Manchu China. They also strongly influence Russia's political and social evolution, and in fact, the development of the entire Eastern Bloc. The western tip of the Eurasian continent, Western Europe, and the island of Japan to its east were spared the nomadic invasions. Uh -huh. If you take these two regions and throw in the United States, a European implant, you have the geographical area now known as the developed world. We wish to address the following questions. Why, when the rest of the world was being driven from pillar to post, first by the nomadic invasions and then by European expansion, did the small continent of Europe develop a scientific and industrial revolution and a form of society that changed man's way of life more than anything since the discovery of fire? We have the if, enlightenment. If an industrial revolution had not taken place in Europe, would it have taken place elsewhere? Was the Industrial Revolution a natural occurrence, something that would have inevitably taken place somewhere sooner or later had it not occurred in Europe, or was uh -huh. it a fluke, the result of an unlikely conjuncture of circumstances that could very well never have happened at all had it not occurred in Europe? Where is the an what, what's the answer? What's the answer? You pose a question. Well, okay, well, what's going on? It, that's very well written, yeah. Before addressing these questions, however, we will touch on another far more fundamental question which is why do we care why the Industrial Revolution occurred in Europe and not elsewhere, or whether it would have occurred elsewhere had it not occurred in Europe? What practical use does the answer have to that question today, 200 years later? In other words, does his, why does history matter and does history matter? Does it matter, for example, that the Rush started out as a Scandinavian colony? Does such an origin to Russia have any implication <laughs> at all for, say, present-day Swedish investment in Russia? Well, they were Swedes. They were Swedes. They were Swedes. Yeah, about. I know. Yeah, yeah. In his book, *The Historian's Craft*, the French historian Marc Bloch discusses these kinds of questions. The book, written during the Second World War, attempts to defend the study of history against the charge of total irrelevance. 
Mark Bloch admits that he, like most historians, has an obsession with origins, a desire to claim that everything in the past is terribly significant for the present. He also maintains that such an obsession is not as crazy as it seems, that in the past it was even widely shared by most educated people. With each new invention of the Industrial Revolution, the railroad, the steam engine, the telegraph, electricity, the study of the past began to seem less and less relevant. In the 19th century, for example, Mark Bloch's high school teacher could say, since 1930, there has been no more history. And finally, in the early 20th century, Henry Ford could say, history is bunk. bunk yeah. Mark Bloch, on the other hand, defends Leibniz's statement about history. Quote, a society that could be completely molded by its immediately preceding period would have to be a structure so malleable as to be virtually invertebrate. It would have to be a society <laughs> in which communication between generations <laughs> was conducted, so to speak, in Indian file, the children having contact with their ancestors only through the mediation of their parents. Mm. In other words, the historical evolution of society is not a Markov process where the future state depends only on the immediate past. The future evolution of society depends on its entire past history. To give a simple physical analogy, let's look at the physics of snowflake formation. The exact shape of a snowflake depends on the air pressure at every point of its entire previous trajectory depends on its entire history, not just on its immediately preceding state. Yeah. Let's assume for the moment that the above an analogy is accurate. Suppose, surely to play the devil's advocate, the study of past history is not always useful. For example, once the snowflake melts or is squashed, then its present shape does not depend on its entire past history. In other words, if some sufficiently momentous event, such as the collision of the Earth with a large comet, or the invention of a new source of cheap, limitless, non-polluting power takes place, then for many purposes, its impact on human society overwhelms the effect of past right, history. Right, 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 yeah. When Henry Ford, for example, said history's bug, wasn't he right? Wasn't the study of past production techniques as misleading as it was useful for his purposes? Uh, he was the one who invented the assembly line. Uh, I know. I, we, I'm from Detroit. Well, it's a sidebar, and uh, our, my maternal side, they, they had a house on 16th Street in Detroit. In Detroit, yeah. And Henry Ford, when he was about eight or nine years old, used oh, to really? tinker in their garage. Oh, you could When he was that. just tinkering, he was yeah, getting yeah. going to make the Model A and everything. So Detroit was built up, and the industrial... It's very interesting you have that. Uh, I, you, you wanted to read some more? Okay. okay so in okay, answering the question, does history matter, I think first have to answer four questions. Whose history, matter to whom, yeah. matter what way and right. when. To the vast majority of people in 19th century Europe, a knowledge of Japanese history had no practical use whatsoever. Right, right, right. Yet to Japanese reformers of the Meiji period, a knowledge of Western history proved to be very useful indeed. Uh -huh. The Spanish conquistadors had little use for the intricacies of pre-1942 South American history excuse me, pre-1492 South American history, right. yet for North American investors, a knowledge of pre-1992 South American history might be useful. Mm. So to answer the above question, matter to whom? We say matter to decision makers. Uh -huh. Does history matter to decision makers? Right. Well, obviously an accurate prognosis of future conditions matters to decision makers. But when, under what circumstances, does the study of past history matter to decision makers? For example, suppose that some revolutionary new technologies, such as cold fusion, materializes, yeah. whose commercial repercussions are immediately apparent and enormous. In such a case, would time be better spent in analyzing these commercial repercussions and not in worrying about past history? Are these your words? These are my words. Yeah, is that cold? You think Pond's cold, f cold fusion has a... That's a good question. Uh, I, don't I don't think it does. I don't I think don't it think does. Everybody but you know, ever it. since I can remember, it's always been fusion, fusion is the fusion, answer fusion because it's the unlimited. They got... Okay, go ahead, yeah. Conversely, in a period of benign and stable economic expansion, such as occurred, for example, in the post-war period prior to the 1970s, Purely mechanical takes of the forecasting gave reasonably useful results. Under such circumstances, to discover, to under such circumstances, to study, say, the history of the various regions of the world and the history of the interaction between these regions, and to try to anticipate how these historical tendencies will work themselves out in the future, is to put it mildly overkill. And how uh, it, it, one of the problems we have is time. You know, because there's a tyranny in this universe. It's called the tyranny of time. The tyranny right? of time. And we're run out. We've only got about five, you know, six. We've only got about, uh, you know, ten, five min ten five minutes, minutes left. Okay, okay well, to make a So, words, we're, we're, that's really well written. That's your words yeah. and your partners you write together? Or? Uh, 
Well, I wrote it, and he, he sort of nifty. Okay, well, it. that was that's really good writing and everything. So where do we stand now? How do you think we stand? Uh, we've been talking about the Middle East and that sort of thing as a flashpoint. It's very worrying. Uh, weapons have become... You're Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Massachusetts Institute of Technology. You're very knowledgeable about things, and you're scientifically yeah. inclined and so forth. And one of the things I, I say often, I'd like to get... Re, I'd like to get chapter and verse, as it were, yeah. uh, whether or not after 200,000 years of our existence as a homo sapien species on this planet and the use of realpolitik as a re re reigning principle in which the political relationships between the various power structures that exist upon the world have uh, led to a point where on the Damoclean sword kind of way of the, le of the one vector, uh, the weapon systems gave advantages to people over the history of the world. Yeah, right. And we had the terrible thing in 1962, the Cuban Missile Crisis. The Cuban Missile Crisis. But apparently from about 1970, as some of the dating goes, the modeling goes, modeling is ma yeah. mathematical, uh, the weapon systems became, and I'm wondering if you think uh, on it or whether or not it's correct, the modeling system, the weapons that exist, weapon systems, not inflection points of idea, but the weapon systems that exist, and if they were to be unleashed in a spasm of hatred, which has been so characteristic, yeah, so characteristic. that their species lethal. Do you the think? Species, yeah, absolutely. No, no, wait. You have chapter and verse on that. Do you have? Do you have uh, the modeling that would irrevocably show that? the weapon systems would be able to, if they're unleashed, the capability, not just ideas, but the capability, but the capability or the capacity is that if, if they're unleashed, it could mean the end of the homo sapiens species. The end of species. homo sapiens, I know. You do think that. Yeah. But fortunately, the Cold War is over. Well, okay, but that doesn't obviate the fact of the, it's, the la it's like latent heat in, in, in tornadoes. There's latent heat, and uh, it's it's a it's a capability that isn't the reality, but there's a capability that is that signaling anything that we get to the point where we can stop evolution with the systems that we have extended our consciousness yeah, into, yeah, right. and so. Uh, I, are we at a time of qualitative transformation on evolutionary terms? Yeah, I think so. Hopefully, you do. Yeah, hopefully. Okay. Hopefully we'll get past the 99.9% of all species that have ever existed have gone extinct. Are gone you aware extinct. of that? Yeah, yeah absolutely. In evolution? That's in evolution. sort of disquieting. Yeah. That's disquieting. If we yeah. have a capability to extinguish ourselves. We have the capability to extinguish ourselves. Do we have on the adverse side of that yin-yang or whatever, the op uh, the uh, a unique capability of providing for a greater percentage of the world population to be what would be, Cervantes said there's only two classes in the world haves and have-nots. You can measure. How yeah. do you get a measure? What does it mean to be a have? You know? And he said that, uh, that we could have uh, a situation where we could, we, 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 that there are more haves and have-nots at a level of capability. We have a capability of providing for everyone unprecedented, absolutely, exponentially, absolutely, absolutely. exponentially growing exponentially in this growing. very time at which you and I sit here and talk. Yeah, absolutely. And that we may actually have transcended material scarcity. We may have transcended material scarcity. As an scarcity. ontologic reality. Yeah, absolutely. And we have policies that are all based on reified institutions out of a historical condition of scarcity, well, scarcity that right. has led to the fight. Yeah. And, that it, and that's within an ecological context. Yeah, well, so right that now, we're at a time of qualitative, almost, you have to compare it to evolutionary change, not just political or historical change, but evolutionary, evolutionary change. change. We yeah. may be opening on some punctuated equilibrium in our relationship to the universe beyond what we've been for 200,000 years. Yeah. Or what do you make of that? Or how do you see things? And isn't it odd that we would live in a time, our generation, our generation. of that qualitative Transformative, transformative period, yeah. and how would we fit that, uh, the, 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 the political reading of things, into that larger ontological reality? Yeah, and what's question. your thoughts on it? Well, I think, you know, we've reached an age where scarcity is no longer necessary. You do think that? Yeah, absolutely. Is there modeling that can show that? 
Is yeah, there I, some I mean, way it can be demonstrated? Who does the modeling that demonstrates well, okay, that? Uh, there's a book by Lance Taylor called Reconstructing Macroeconomics. Thank you. Mans, Lance Taylor. Lance Taylor. L-A-N-C-E-T-A-Y-L-O-R. Lance Taylor. L-A-N-C-E-T-A-Y-L-O-R. Yeah, right. Uh, wrote a book along those lines called Reconstructing Macroeconomics. Recently? Uh, I forget. I, uh, I, I well, don't know. Re, well, within the last 20 within years. The, oh, yeah. Within yeah, the okay, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. And then Jeffrey Williamson also wrote a book along those lines called History and Glo Globalization and History. Those are a couple sources that So I highly, I highly recommend those sources. Those are, those are books. Oh, books, yeah, books. Is there modeling? I think there's modeling There's in the modeling that demonstrates that. Bucky Fuller used yeah, Bucky to Fuller have, used to Bucky do that. Fuller yeah. used to say, we need an operating manual for spaceship, for spaceship Earth. Earth right. And he would present the context of that. Uh, all the king's horses and all the king's men with trillions of dollars and all of our institutions, they've not come up with a system yeah. that is able to realize the positive capability, an yeah. operating manual for, uh, spaceship, for spaceship Earth. Earth. Do you understand what yeah. I'm saying? It's a qualitative transformation a qualitative that thing. is being called for in evolutionary terms, don't you think? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, um, I'm sorry, I got off on a rant, but your book uh, deals with that. Yeah, it deals with that. Deals yeah. with that larger issue. That larger, that larger issue. And you think, you seem to, you, you said, you, you think we live in that? In that era, yeah. 10,000 generations that ours would be the one that is the singular moment in the evolution yeah, of so, things. Yeah. That's pretty staggering to yeah, think, that is, how yeah. come we were born into such an yeah, that's interesting a good question, time? Yeah. Do you think about these things? Yeah, I think about these things. Okay, yeah. well, your books contribute to that. They're yeah. very well written. And I'm sorry I got off on a rant, but just to put it in a large context, it's an amazing time. Yeah, it's an amazing time. Yeah. You, we agree on yeah, that. Yeah, I agree on that. You can send me some of those links or links to some... Uh, uh, yeah, I'll send you some of those links. Reference to some of, to some of those links. I'll send you the reference. And you'll send it, we can get it out to the people in general. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, well, listen, one of the things is, is like we say, well, we got about a, two minutes left, oh, so okay. you want to give some closing thoughts and okay, everything well, like that into your book? The history chapter of closing yeah. thoughts. Yeah. Um, the reason why the West developed in a different direction than the rest, than the rest of the world yeah. is that when the Roman Empire collapsed into right. the hands of the Latin magnates, it never, it never re really truly revived. Yeah. In other words, there was never a centralized go uh, government in Europe. Yeah. And so competition oh, and see, progress. Yeah. Uh -huh. in, in the rest of the world, when a centralized government collapsed, another would arise along yeah, the same right, right, like right. the dynasties in China and yeah, right, 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 right. the Middle East. But in, in the West, you had competing powers which forced technological progress on them. Okay. And the kings were forced to depend on commerce and science for the revenues they could provide right. because they didn't have the power over the peasants that the governments in China and India To and be Minister. continued, and this to be. story, Lawrence, so good to talk to you. Your pleasure, the perceptions then of Lawrence uh, Finer, PhD, uh, mathematics, MIT, a very thoughtful person who's concerned with the human condition in very broad general terms. A lot of systems thinking goes yeah. into that. And if ever we needed systems thinking rather than specialization, which is all yeah. Too, yeah. too far to be found, uh, it's, uh, it's at this particular time. So thank you very much in the audience for viewing. I guess we could run the credits. And then uh, thank you for coming in, oh, Lawrence. Okay. So good to see you. I would like you to send me some of those links. Those to links, get some yeah, of those yeah.